Today we have Guy and Brenton with us. Guy is the CTO at Profero, and uh, Brenton leads um, incident response activities at Profero. Profero is a cyber ma uh, uh, <laughs> it's a uh, uh, cyber risk management firm, right? Yes, cyber crisis management firm. And thank you so much for being here with us today, and thank you for speaking to us. The floor is yours. <clears throat> Testing. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to our talk on what was the Log4J roller coaster from our perspective, which was that of an incident response company. So when we initially came up with this idea, we did have the idea to use the concept of the nightmare before Christmas, because that's what Log4J was for a lot of, uh, a lot of us. But instead, we decided to go with something a bit more accurate, which was uh, the roller coaster that was the Log4J uh, situation, because it was quite the emo emotional roller coaster. So who are we? So, well, okay. Uh, my name is Guy, I'm the CTO at Profero. Uh, I also uh, work a lot in the community and I'm one of the founders of uh, Besides Tel Aviv. Uh, my name is, hello, testing. My name is Brenton Morris. I'm a senior incident responder at Profero and I've spoken at some uh, cloud uh, webinar summits before about cloud security. So how it all began, uh, I'm from New Zealand, so for me it was a Thursday night and I was getting my daily um, doom scrolling in on Twitter before falling asleep and I saw some chatter about a Minecraft vulnerability that was coming out. So there was a lot of talk about how you could hack into a Minecraft server and I thought first, well that's kind of funny, and then second was, am I still running a Minecraft server somewhere? Um, so after checking and finding out that I was not, I went to sleep. Um, and this is the tweet that I saw uh, that picked up all the, like, the fuss about it. And then when I woke up the following morning, I had a message from Omri, our CEO, and it essentially said something along the lines of, uh, hey, mate, wake up. The internet is on fire with a smiley face at the end of the message. So everything was on fire, as, as I learned. Um, at this time, there were some public uh, uh, exploit um, code projects available on GitHub, and this was, uh, this was one of the ones that was uh, widely used um, when the first initial exploitation started. And shortly after, we started to see, even a few months after the fact, there was just article after article about companies getting breached by this vulnerability. So we got a call from an existing client on that Friday, um, and they had detected some coin miner traffic in their network. So we came in and we started looking at this coin miner, and we eventually managed to connect the dots between the coin miner traffic that we were seeing and the Minecraft exploit. So when we first looked at the Minecraft exploit, we didn't, seem, we didn't think it seemed very important. Um, it created a lot of fuss, but we didn't think it was too cyber related. Um, and that was on day zero. And then by day one, we started seeing um, the first attacks that were coming through. So we saw coin miners on one of our client's systems. Um, we didn't really connect the dots at first, but that this was related to the Minecraft vulnerability. But then after doing some analysis, um, we found a lot of the same exploit strings and some of the log files, and by looking at that, we figured out this is actually that, that random Minecraft vulnerability that everyone is talking about. Um, and this was used to get RCE on a few servers and deploy coin miners. Um, so this happened roughly 24 hours from the public exploit being released to our first detection of it being used maliciously. And we figured, as the coin miners usually do, that they were prepping prior to the incident because whenever a RCE comes out like this, it seems to be that coin miners are always the first to jump on it and mass um, deploy whatever malware that they're using. Um, so again, this wasn't a new exploit. Uh, the vector was actually known for quite some time. There were some really old GitHub projects showing some proof of concepts on this type of attack, but it wasn't very popular. It wasn't widely exploited. Um, no one was really using it. 
And then day one plus plus and onwards, we're still seeing attacks uh, in the wild. We've dealt with quite a few, uh, which were actually log4j. And this one in particular, it was a new customer, um, and they came to us and they were having issues. And we determined that the attack was log4j. And we actually gave them a tool that we had written to help scan their network and find all of their um, vulnerable machines. And one of the things found was unpatched at the time and still is unpatched today. So to give you a little bit of background about what log4j is, and I won't go into a, a, a very detailed technical explanation, uh, I'll stay on the hand wavy side. So whenever uh, you're logging uh, some strings into your uh, infrastructure and you're using log4j, you can use the capabilities of the log4j library to enrich the code that you have. For example, if you're logging stuff like user IDs from your front end to the back end, you can use log4j to replace the strings of the user IDs with the actual user names from an LDAP server that you have. So that is a very useful feature when you're doing logs because that will help you narrow down the time to understand what went wrong and enrich the logs that you have. The problem is that the, the log4j vulnerability uh, exploited that enrichment mechanism and allowed the attacker to send some string in and then the log4j library will replace that string with that enrichment. It would exploit that enrichment and it would lead to the remote code exploitation on the server itself. A big uh, thing to notice here is that the thing that is getting popped, the machine that is getting exploited, is not the machine that actually saw the logs coming in. It's the machine that does the log enrichment itself. This creates a big problem for us as incident responders, but also for architects trying to understand what the system is doing. Because when some browser is creating a request and the system is logging the request, this is pretty much in the same time frame, 100 milliseconds, one second, something like that. But the enrichment mechanism that goes back in the background, it's something that usually goes in batches. It might be every four hours, every 12 hours. So there is a big time disconnect between when the actual attack is versus when the attack is triggered and you actually see it. So the attacker might... Let's do it like this. Yeah. So the attacker might start by sending some request to the API. The log would capture it and it will be moved to the log enrichment. The log enrichment, it's taken at a separate point in time, and only then it will be uh, placed in the remote storage. But because this is a bulk process, that means that the enrichment itself will take at some indefinite time in the future, and only then would the exploit occur. So the way that these exploits are written is that you contact the server, and the server will contact back the attacker whenever the background system uh, is doing whatever it's supposed to do. So the problem that we had is that we know that there's a vulnerability called log4j, which is built on the fact that there's a log4j software library being used by different software backends, appliances, products, etc. And our customers were pretty scared. They're panicking because they didn't know if they have log4j or not. And nobody actually knows what kind of software they're running, especially if you're buying something from a vendor. So the problem setting was, find out where are we running log4j. You have a huge organization, many, many different appliances. How do you even know what is running log4j or not? This is a software dependency. It's not like a CVE in an operating system. You can just check your versions. So... The first facet of the problem was that we don't actually have an SBOM, a software bill of materials. So when you go and buy a VPN appliance or you buy some, uh, uh, um, I don't know, EDR or antivirus, you don't actually know what is the software that is being run on. You're buying a product. It's a complete turnkey solution. You don't know how they built it. The second thing is that when the vendors started being hit by Log4j, they're very, very slow to report that they're vulnerable. The community actually came together and started opening GitHub repositories with confirmed the appliances that were vulnerable to log4j and logging their versions so other people can just go and look at those lists because the vendors were not releasing information. And thirdly, um, the library is a dependency. 
And that means that you can't actually actively scan for it because it might not be there when you're scanning. For example, if someone is building a Docker container and only when you're building the container it's fetching the remote library, you won't find the library in your code base. So there's nothing to scan when you're scanning. You have, to really, you have to actually see the process when it's running in order to know if it's using Log4j or not. So the problem was really big. We had customers, lots of different customers with a lot of different uh, machines running in the network, and they had no idea what's running Log4j or not. They didn't get any answers from the vendors owning or uh, maybe not owning, but uh, working those different appliances, and they turned to us to try to help them. And the, uh, I kept using the on-premise example, but that's actually not the only thing, because you don't know if you have uh, a cloud-based or hybrid cloud-based uh, machines running that might also be vulnerable to Log4j, and you won't even be aware of it. So... The, the tools that were on the scene when uh, uh, Log4j broke out were, let's say, unsatisfactory, uh, to say the least. So, like, the first tool that we've seen, uh, as Brenton mentioned, we, it, it all started on Friday. On Saturday, there was already GitHub repositories with tools for Log4j scanning. So, we did some analysis on that before uh, we uh, authorized our clients to use that open source. By the way, we didn't. But... Uh, the, the way that it worked was relatively simple. The idea was that you can send a log4j sample to some server. The server would log that say, a string that you sent to it. The string would contain some FQDN, some uh, uh, URL or address. When the log4j library would try to resolve that address, it would reach a DNS server. The DNS server will log the name of the server doing the DNS resolution, and then you would know that this... Uh, server that did the DNS resolution was vulnerable to log4j because it did the DNS resolution. Pretty straightforward, a nice idea, nice implementation. So what's the problem? The problem was that the scanning capability is really limited and the DNS itself set in China. And that meant that anybody using this open source was actually feeding that DNS a list of all of the internal network servers that are vulnerable to log4j directly to whoever was maintaining that list on that DNS server in China. They might have been absolutely benign, they might have been nice people or not, but probably you don't want to feed a list of your vulnerable server to some external party. So we decided that we have to take a different approach. We weren't happy with the solution that were out there. Again, this is Saturday morning. Um, we weren't very happy with that. We decided to do something else. We took a different approach, something that should work like NMAP. We want a, a binary to run on the network that will scan the entire IP uh, address range, try to contact each and every server that answers to port 80 or port 443, and if it has uh, some sort of answer, it will send a, a query string for uh, log4j. That query string will include a, a poisoned LDAP request. That binary that is doing the scanning is also a fake LDAP server. It doesn't really implement LDAP, just answers LDAP requests. And if somebody or some server uh, that got that log4j string will try to LDAP query that fake server, it will go in the list and it will be written down as a vulnerable server, which is actually uh, a, a nice way to circumvent the problem because we will know two things. The first thing, this is everything is completely local. Everything is happening inside the network without sending any kind of data anywhere. The second thing is this gives us a 100% sure way to know that it if, if a server called back to our fake LDAP, that means that it's vulnerable. Because if it weren't vulnerable, it wouldn't call to our fake LDAP. There's no real LDAP there. Nobody will contact it. Contact it. So I'll lay out what we've done. So this was already released on Sunday morning, the first iteration, which was the without the fake LDAP server. The first iteration just listening on uh, TCP connections but it had false positives because sometimes there's uh, equipment scanning the network for open ports. So by Tuesday, we already released the second version that had the LDAP implementation to make it really foolproof. So we fit the tool with a, a network segment, like, uh, uh, let's see. So we have 192.168.1.99 slash 29. That will give us two IP addresses. We also scan the entire 16 uh, uh, block and scan the entire network of customers. 
it outputs a CSV in the end with all of the different uh, vulnerable, vulnerable servers that actually called back to the fake LDAP server. So that gave our customers a way to um, address the problem of, do I have any vulnerable log4j servers listening inside my network? So because, okay, real example. Uh, I wanted to say something else here. Um, one of the problems that our customers had was how to work that at scale. So they had 5,000 machines, 10,000 machines. Taking this approach allowed us to run the same kind of uh, tool in parallel on different network segments and running on different IP scopes in parallel and really getting results fast without waiting to uh, scan the entire range uh, one by one. So a real life example. Uh, we scanned the network and obviously we found uh, hits. We found uh, servers that replied back to our LDAP server. So now we only have a list of IP addresses. So we took those IP addresses and we started looking in what, what kind of systems are behind these IP addresses. So we find some, uh, a physical server in a data center uh, belonging to some, uh, some vendor clients. And we know it's vulnerable. We know it's vulnerable 100% certain because it called us back. So it wouldn't call us any other way. And we verified it completely. Talking to the vendor, they said, no, we're not vulnerable. We, don't, we are not aware of us being vulnerable at all. So we told them, okay, we understand that you're not aware, but here, look, this is definitive proof that you are vulnerable. And they said, no, we, don't, we are not really vulnerable. So we said, this is not an argument. You are vulnerable. Take this curl command, run it, and you will see that you are vulnerable. There's nothing mysterious going on. And finally, after a week of going back and forth with them, we came to the realization that the reason that they don't know that they are vulnerable is because they don't have any way to test if they are vulnerable or not, and they don't have any way to mitigate the fact that they are running log4j. So they didn't have any patch mechanism to replace that library without taking the entire appliance and running it through QA again. So that was the, the actual uh, issue. And the result of that was that we know that that uh, appliance was vulnerable, but there are no fix in sight. They were not planning on releasing anything. So going back to the timeline from Friday, where we saw the first coin miner activities that came from Log4J, to uh, Sunday, where we released the first version, to Tuesday, uh, it was a really hectic effort to, to get on top of this while we're still trying to understand the, the scope of the vulnerability, what are the different uh, exploit mechanisms that you could employ with the log4j library. There are a couple of different attack vectors that you could employ and how to uh, quickly assess if you're vulnerable or not. By the end of that week, there are already large GitHub uh, pages uh, that we also contributed to with a known vulnerable appliances and versions of those appliances. So, why did we do open source? So we took this tool that I just uh, showed you, and by, I think, Wednesday, something like that, like a day after we released it, we already released it as open source to the community. And we had a couple of reasons behind it. The first one is, as an incident response company, we don't make money out of making tools. We don't sell tools. So we wanted to release it as fast as possible so everybody else could use it as well. The second thing is that well, everything was on fire. We wanted to help, we wanted to uh, put it out there so people can reduce the level of the flames. And thirdly, when we do something open source and we share it back with the community, the community shares back with us. And that is, if they found a bug, they found a better way to do something, they found a new uh, attack vector that we didn't cover, all of that feeds back to us. We can improve the tool, we can help our customers. So there's nothing wrong with doing open source on the other hand, we believe in open source and we do release our tools and we do release our research. So when the log4j, uh, let's call it calamity, broke out, it's kind of deteriorated really, really fast from something that was purely technical to something that was very emotional and really uh, fanned the flames of being against those uh, uh, really small group of developers. Uh, we've seen remarks uh, addressing what a bunch of stupid people they are. Why is my logging library even doing remote calls? Why can't it just log? Uh, who made these uh, insane architectural decisions? Uh, a lot of hate speech against those uh, uh, maintainers of that open source project. 
And one of the things uh, that really uh, came out was that uh, this was during Christmas, so uh, last Christmas, and people were really, really resentful of the fact that there is an exploit out there, that they have to work on it during Christmas, and that they have to keep working on it during Christmas because there's no easy fix for a problem in a software library. Um, when the Log4j uh, team, there are about three people, it's not like a huge team, uh, when they uh, released a version or like a fix for a specific attack vector and everybody deployed it to their system, it was a very painful process, and then they released another fix for a different attack vector, and now people had to deploy again. And that also raised the hate speech online. Why can't they just fix it already? Why do we have to keep redeploying? It's Christmas morning, I want to be with my family, I don't want to be at work which is understandable, but the hate speech wasn't. And all of the people who worked on it, either internally in their own companies or in other places, they haven't contributed anything back. So if they fix their own implementations of Log4j for whatever reason, they haven't upstream what they've done. They didn't contribute back to open source the solutions that they found to the problems that they tried to fix, which also heightened the problem of this open source package. And it got ugly, uh, seriously, it, it really got ugly. It, was, it, it made us so uncomfortable uh, that we were seeing these attacks because we knew how it looked like on the other side. They were frantically trying to help people working on a project that was, I don't remember, like eight years old at the time. It was a relatively old and stable project. Think of it this way, by being old and stable, how many different appliances, vendors, software packages, uh, products you're aware of that were hit by Log4j, that means that they incorporated Log4j many years ago and are still using it. And it was all over the place. And this is a project run by a couple of guys. So we decided to take a stand and we wanted to, ver to be very publicly on the side of the maintainers saying what is happening here is wrong. And we wanted, uh, as Americans say, to put our money where our mouth is and decided to make a donation. However, we found out when we reached out to them that, again, I'm stressing, this is a huge project, not in the line of code, but in its usage. Uh, when we reached out to them to say, look, we want to donate money, tell us what the process is, they told us we have no process. It never happened before. Nobody donated money to us. And we decided to uh, donate to the Apache organization because they were under the Apache umbrella of open source projects being maintained. So the story that they, they told us is that over the years, they got like a couple of hundred dollars over the years to like, thank you for your efforts. But nobody ever supported the project in any significant way, not in contribution to upstreams and not in a financial contribution for them to uh, compensate for their time and effort over the years or even specifically during the Log4j incident itself. So we kind of uh, took the flag and stuck it to the ground and tried to rally other companies to do the same, especially to take ownership of the fact that they are using the open source code. And open source code might have problems like any other piece of code, but stand behind your product, stand behind your decision to use that library and try to do something good. However, we failed. We failed miserably. We couldn't rally anyone to that cause. Nobody really cared. And sorry, I skipped to hear it happen. Uh, nobody really cared. And that was amazing for us to see because we know that the amount of companies that actually used Log4j is such a huge list of, uh, uh, of companies. Just by going over those GitHub pages with the list of vulnerable appliances, you can go, the list goes on and on and on, page after page after page after page. And all of them made money on top of that project. So I'm not saying donate money to that project or uh, cut a percentage to the project. But if you have developers and they can fix something, contribute to upstream, bring that fix to everyone, not just to your own implementation. And even that didn't happen. So now we'll, we'll talk a, a little about how we try to prepare to respond to something completely unknown. No one could have seen Log4j coming. No one was ready for it. Um, everyone was ready for their holidays instead and whatever they were doing with their families. So this quote comes to mind, which I won't attempt to read out loud, um, but I think everyone knows the quote from Donald Rumsfeld about the known unknowns. Um, 
And so one strategy that we use a lot is living off the land. So attackers do this really well. Um, they're always looking for tools that are already pre-existing in environments that they can use to their advantage. And we believe that defenders should be doing the same thing. So you get to know your infrastructure really well. You have the benefit that you can learn um, all the tools you have in place. You know what's in your infrastructure. You know what is available to you. Um, and you can find some pretty creative ways to use these things uh, to respond to these kinds of incidents. So the tools you have in place determine how well you can respond um, to an incident like this. So we, as an IR team, we look at IR solutions um, for this particular SBOM problem. So when we were searching for um, processes and servers that we're using Log4j, we took quite a few different um, approaches. So we already had EDR in place in the first incident. Um, they were an existing client of ours, so all of our EDR and tools were installed. So we used EDR to scan for any Java processes to create a list of um, first-line suspects. From there, we were then um, doing some memory scanning on these processes and looking for the Log4j footprint itself so we could narrow down what was actually using Log4j. And then at the same time, we were building our network scanner to scan the network side and try and find anything that we have may, may have missed. And also, of course, um, in most cases, your client doesn't install EDR on every machine. So sometimes you get results back from the network scan for machines you didn't even know really um, existed there. And on top of that, we do a lot of log collection in our client system. So we're looking in these, these logs for IOCs. We're looking in the logs for maybe the exploit string or servers that were being used um, in the mass exploitation of, of this bug. So what actually worked for us and what can work for you? So pre-integrations, so that really helped the fact that we already had our tools and everything in place. Um, this really helped reduce the time it took for us to respond to this, uh, this kind of event. We were ready to hit the ground running straight away. So making sure you have um, the tools in place in your network, things like EDR, things that you can use to scan for this kind of thing. Um, and we went with the concept of not reinventing the wheel, so only invent it once. So we, um, we like to develop reusable tools. So when we developed our scanner, we built it in a way that was an easy CLI tool that people could use. Um, and it's something that we can deploy at scale. It's fast, it's light, it's a single binary. You can drop it on a machine and run it. Um, and then collect the log file with EDR or whatever you've got in place um, after that. So we also wanted the same to be able to be used by the community, so we've really touched on that. We released it as open source. But how can you help your IR team in a situation like this? So the first thing is the, the one that is the most boring but is the most useful, in my opinion, and that's better logs. So keeping more logs, keeping them for a longer period of time, um, you want to be having good EDR installed across everything. Don't miss machines. Don't leave blind spots that attackers can use. Um, you want EDR on your PCs. You want it on your servers. You want it on your, on your clusters. You want it on everything. Um, and have a plan in place. So that means knowing who you're going to call, um, knowing who the escalation points are. When something like this happens, a lot of the time, a lot of the team members have never dealt with IR team before. They don't know who the contact is. They don't know how to escalate to an IR team. Um, so you just want to make sure that you're familiar with whoever the escalation point is. They should, uh, it shouldn't be awkward to reach out and contact them. You should contact them uh, whenever you think that it's needed. So, bef sorry. So before I, I, I move to our summation, uh, I do want to highlight this point. We do incident response, and this is not a classic incident uh, case, there is no active attacker in most systems. So for most of our customers or for the community at large, there was no active attack that was happening. People were scrambling to find out if they're actually vulnerable or not. So it's not like a traditional case where you say, look, I have indication that someone is in my system trying to mess with them. It's rather there, am I even vulnerable to this type of attack? Most people or most organizations will not reach out to their IR teams to uh, activate an incident when they don't know that there's an attacker in the system. However, everything which we try to share here and show you here is that you can utilize IR, uh, uh, the incident response tooling and mindset, in order to solve or to think about differently about these large-scale problems because in its essence, 
the problem here was no different from the other troubles that we are handling day to day in incidents. The main difference was that there was no active attacker in the system. So to summarize, and maybe the first rule is don't panic. <laughs> Might sound funny, but I think the the uh, Brenton mentioned in the, uh, the the beginning of the talk the emotional roller coaster that we've all been on. Anybody who's on Log4J. So we started out with being like everything on the internet is on fire. Then there was uh, uh, a fix was out. Then the fix didn't fix. Then we had another rollout, another deployment. It didn't fix. Scrambling to find out if the system were affected or not. Finding out the system you didn't think were affected actually were affected because you didn't know how they were affected. Vendors did not disclose information. It was a difficult couple of weeks while we saw this. And during these couple of weeks, while we're all scrambling to find out if we're vulnerable or not, we started seeing actual attacks utilizing that attack vector. So it's not like we were scrambling in vain. We were trying to uh, 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 be ahead of the curve because we knew that the attacks were coming. So a couple of uh, uh, bullet points to help you uh, maybe in the future if you have this kind of unknown, what, what am I going to do about this? Consult with your IR team. They might be able to bring a new kind of thinking into the game that you are not aware of. The second thing is that you can use those IR methods like scanning memory, finding out what kind of processes are running, if you're vulnerable or not at scale, without actually having an incident. This is what we do when there is an incident, but the same tools would work in other situations. Also, um, when you are thinking about cyber incidents in 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 practice, you're trying to be prepared for an unknown. You're trying to be prepared for something of an unknown nature that would occur at an unknown time. So investing your time and effort in being prepared to that unknown, where that unknown happens, can save you time when an incident happens, but also when something like Log4j happens. In the end, we can utilize the same things for the same purposes. Uh, if you are keeping good logs and you have a scale collection of data, so you're not just picking and choosing what you're collecting, but really collecting from a lot of different places, it will help you when something unknown happens because you will have the data to query to find out what is going on. So if you can, invest in good log collection. It's better to have those logs and to throw them away after 30 days than not having those logs. And, and this might sound stupid, but know your own environment. One of the things that we found out again and again in many different customers is that the customers or the IT people's perception of what they have in their environment versus what they actually had in their environment might differ by 100%. So run these exercises and try to discover what you have in your own environment and keep records. I have these appliances with these versions. It will make your life easier when we try to match it up against vulnerable versions if you are uh, uh, vulnerable to some sort of attack or not. If you are not even aware that you have that appliance and you only uh, become aware of it a week into the game, you might be a very unhappy camper. So finally, um, we uh, looked at this incident uh, as an IR thing from start to finish, but there were no active attackers. So we try to share with you here how you can take this IR thinking and implement it into these kinds of uh, incidents. And there will be other types of these incidents. This is not in, related to IR only. And we hope that you can take this experience and what we shared here and implement in uh, your own organizations, in your own day-to-day uh, -day life. And with that, any questions? The previous talk handed out koalas. I don't have any koalas to hand out, but would love the questions. Hey, so on our team, we build reusable components, not log4j, but you can imagine things along those lines. Is there anything that we can do beyond simple S-bombs that will make your lives as IRs easier? Um, the first thing is that if you have any kind, well, it depends on what your system does, but the basic tenant is if you're doing something, log it. And if you're logging it, don't log it locally, log it in some uh, uh, centralized repository so we can uh, access that data and correlate it with anything else that's happening. So from an IR point of view, the first thing is visibility. We need to have access to logs, we need to have access to systems. So depending on what you do, logs is probably be the first line.
Any other questions? Maybe a quick question. Where do we find the tools that you release as open source? Um, that's a good point. I should have put a link here in one of the slides. <laughs> it was eight months ago, so it wasn't really relevant. Uh, it's on GitHub. If you just look for Log4j Scanner, you'll find it. Or you'll look for Log4j Profero, you'll find it as well. Okay, let's thank uh, Guy and Brenton. Thank you very much.